Yeah, no, no it's the um, MCC is taking over um, this building. So um, we are done. We are done here. Camp must have been nice and cool today. Who? Camp must have been nice and cool today. It's the surface of the sun out there. Well, I felt like I'm, yeah, I was a mess after practice. I was worried about showing up here, but I was, <laughs> it was, I was dried out by the time I came over here. So I didn't really, I timed my shaving really badly. I tried, <laughs> I don't shave every day. Yeah. And I hadn't shaved for a long time until yesterday. So I looked better today than <laughs> yesterday than today. I mean, you know. Are you going to watch the game somewhere tonight? Yeah, I'm going to Cougars, actually, after this. Uh, I'm thinking about going to uh, Jeff Duncan said he wanted to go to Kingpin because of the food truck that's out there on Thursdays. Oh, yeah. Is, is that the pizza one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty, yeah, that's pretty good. I've never had it. It's he good. said it's awesome. Yeah. Where's, Where's Kingpin King at? Britannia, right around the corner from, like, Kyoto and Latai. And all okay. Right. Mm -hmm. It's right it's off like of Britannia. It's on, what is that street? I don't even know. Yeah. Is it Upper, upper line? line? Yeah, because it's Upper Line's on the... Yeah, it's half a block... It's half a block towards the river on Upper Line from okay. Britannia, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the TV situation there just isn't very good to watch two games because <coughs> the U.S. game being. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is the first place award winner of the 2015 New Orleans Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we'll talk a lot about the New Orleans Saints, the New Orleans Pelicans. We'll take a look at LSU and Tulane. we got some great guests to break it down for you on our panel tonight. Scott Kushner of the New Orleans Advocate and Brett Martell, the Associated Press, join us tonight. We'll go to your phone calls a little bit after the half-hour mark of the show tonight. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. As always, thanks so much for being with us. Scott, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the Advocate. What's going on at the New Orleans Advocate? It's uh, draft time for the Pelicans, so we got about uh, we got exactly one week uh, from right now. Here it's uh, sitting here on Thursday, and uh, we have draft coverage wall to wall, and then uh, obviously a lot of stuff going on with Tulane as well as they enter football season whole new uh, athletic department this is his first real off season so a lot going on yeah no doubt brett welcome back as always thanks so much for being with us tell us about the associated press yeah well i'm fresh off three days in the heat and <laughs> a little bit in the uh, rain right at uh on airline drive with the saints for mini camp and they're done of course until training camp but uh you know with ap obviously we have to cover everything so i'm moving into mm -hmm. Pelicans draft stuff in the coming week, as well as the Benson trial right. uh, in federal court starting Monday. Um, so it's a lot going on at the same time, but I'll try to keep up. <laughs> yeah, no, you always do. <laughs> Let's start off with the Saints, and I'll start with you, Brett, since you were at minicamp for all three days. Uh, just your overall thoughts on, on minicamp itself. Well, uh, there were some, you know, nice highlights. It's really hard to tell, uh, you know, and the coaches will tell you this as well. Um, I really see these off-season practices, uh, OTAs as well as minicamp, as uh, 
a way for the coaches to make sure everyone knows what they're supposed to do when training camp starts, and that's where the real evaluations begin. So this is more like teaching mm -hmm. and giving guys an opportunity to hit the ground running on July 28th and 29th and stuff when the first practices get going. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I try not to read too much into it, mm -hmm. but it's nice to see some certain guys looking healthy and some athleticism. It's nice to see some of the new linebackers like like Eric uh, Robertson and Nate Stupar, you know, some kind of like four or five year veteran guys that have come in to kind of bolster that linebacker core right. that probably needed some help. <laughs> <Needs> <laughs> and they're around the ball and they're making plays and everybody loves their, you know, what, what the depth that they're bringing to that unit. Denel Ellibri saying that he expects to be fully healthy and ready to go and hopefully have his first healthy season in three years, you know, uh, coming up. So, you know, that all that stuff is is encouraging and plus the players really seem to be raving about the locker room mm -hmm. and the camaraderie and the sense of purpose in there. But that's also typical at this yeah. time of year. <laughs> no, no doubt. Uh, Scott, you, you've been through enough uh, NFL camps and, and, and college camps. It is about retention. It is about what you've learned in the classroom and taking that to the practice field and being able to, to be able to uh, uh, go through the game plan or whatever play is called flawlessly. And then again, for a lot of guys that are looking because there's not pads, it's about athleticism. You know, is the guy, uh, what type of athlete he is. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on minicamp OTAs? A lot of people get so pumped up about it, but, you know, I, th I think you got to kind of pump the brakes a little bit when you, when you start talking about, uh, you know, football is a game with pads. It's a violent game. And when you're playing touch football, you really can't figure out what's going on on the NFL level. Football's a game that starts in August. Too. Yeah. I mean, agreed. it's all this stuff. Uh, it's, it's great uh, for fans. It's mm -hmm. great for media because there's something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's so far and away the most popular sport, not only in this city, but across the country. Sure. Everybody wants to know about football. We cover spring football in college. It's all a little bit overdone. I think it's a little overwrought. And I think the people inside of it, I think the media, I think everybody, even the fans for the most part, understand understand that a lot of what happens this week isn't really going to affect anything once that ball is actually kicked off in September yep. and games count. Uh, but there are things to see. I think seeing someone like Davis Tull actually on the field and what he can bring and then seeing you know a little bit of Dennis Allison's mm -hmm. scheme and how those guys aren't going to be playing linebacker. They're really going to be defensive ends, those smaller guys. You know, you know Edibali is not going to be playing you know, that linebacker spot. He's really going to be hand on the ground. So that's a difference, I think. Right. And that's the kind of stuff you can yeah. probably pick up. And on the flip there. side, Kikaha with the ACL, that mm -hmm. is real news because sure. now you know right. that a guy, an up-and-coming young player, second-round draft pick last year, Certainly. is not going to be available this right. year. So that's too bad. Well, let's talk about that because, I, you know, I think that's that's obviously one of the bigger developments in, in OTAs and minicamp. But what I think it shows is a reflection on where this team is right now in, in terms of depth. They don't have a lot of depth at most positions. I would say where the depth is maybe the strongest would be the running back position right now on mm -hmm. the team. Other than that, I mean, I guess you could say quarterback if you want to talk about McCown, his ability to come in behind Drew Brees. But, man, you look along that offensive line, not, they don't have a lot of mm -hmm. depth. You look along the defensive line, maybe they got some depth on the inside, but it's unproven depth. Still some question marks in that secondary. You've got a lot of bodies at safety. Ultimately, how are they going to play? I mean, it really shows this team doesn't have a tremendous amount of depth going into camp. Right. I, defensive line is interesting because it could end up being deep mm -hmm. if Fairley is really what the coaches say he is, which seems to be a, you know, a player who's off to a disappointing start in his pro career but seems very, very determined and happy. Um, and obviously a player's individual happiness can sometimes affect their perform performance. You know, when he's back in kind of his home region mm -hmm. and he seems to be happy here. And then, of course, everyone seems to think that um, the top overall draft pick rankings is going to be excellent. So, you know, if you're adding these guys with who they already had in there, then there's a chance for the interior defensive line to be pretty good. Uh, uh, at end, you know, Edibali was the second leading sack guy last year, although it was only five sacks. Mm -hmm. and you kind of <laughs> like the, the top two guys to be around the 10 range, yeah. you know, so or or more. Um, but uh, and also he hasn't really been practicing a minute camp because he's hurt, but he seems fine. I've spoken to him in the locker room and he he's just basically being conservative and trying to make sure he's 100 percent for August. So but you're right. There are positions. I mean, they weren't able to address the offensive line really in the draft. They hope they've been able to kind of do it. Mm -hmm through free agency um, and uh, yeah uh, 
your receivers are young. Yeah. But, I mean. <laughs> and not, not a lot of depth there either. Honestly, yeah. when you look, you're, you're, you're really, honestly, Brandon Scott, Coleman when you look at what, and, yeah. what they got right now, receiver, you're hoping some of these guys from last year can emerge, but you're hoping that some of these undrafted free agents can emerge as well. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to have. I mean, they brought Robert Meacham mm-hmm. back in. Right. I mean, that, and, you know, he's saying that he lost a lot of weight and he looks a lot better, and he's someone who I think people around here have a fondness for, but. That's, uh, I mean, an issue if you're bringing Robert Major back in to take a look because there's a pretty good possibility if he plays pretty well, he's going to make the team. Right. Everyone is under, what, 25, 24. I mean, it's a young group and a group that's largely unproven. Right. Uh, you know, they made a, 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 I think if you talk to people around who cover Ohio State, and people who watch a lot of Big Ten football, they're very impressed mm-hmm. with the young Buckeye, Michael right. Thomas right. coming in. I mean, he is. He could be very good, and is going to have to make an impact mm-hmm. immediately. Yes. The same way Brandon Cooks had to mm-hmm. make an impact pretty much immediately. I don't know about Brandon Coleman. I don't know about a lot of those guys. But no Marcus Colston really changes things. And then where do you kind of use that tight end? They right. always want to use the tight end spot mm-hmm. so much with Breeze. Is that going to get developed again to be you know another that Jimmy Graham level? Can they replace Ben Watson? There's there's a lot of questions. Yeah. I, that when you're a team that has consecutive losing records, you're going to have a lot of questions and, and not many answers. Of course. Yeah. Right. Fleener looks promising, but what if Fleener, you know, gets hurt? Right. Or what yeah. if Cooks, God forbid, Cooks gets hurt? Right. And then, I mean, you could end up with I mean, really relying on Thomas as a rookie to do mm-hmm. major stuff along with Snead who you hope will be as good as he was last year, mm-hmm. but Snead was unknown to opposing defenses last year, and this year they're going to know a lot more they about him. They got a book him, on so, him, right. Yeah. And he made a lot of mistakes himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, as, yeah. as, as solid so. as he was in parts, I mean, he made mm-hmm. a ton of errors last right. year. And, you know, I mean, that, but that is kind of the theme across the board on this team right now, and a lot of it has to do with what we've all talked about before. You know, you miss on drafts like, like they've done since 06, especially within the last five years of, of again, players not making, making the, the club off the draft. Then you look at the misses in free agency, you know, paying big money, maybe rewarding your own. And because of that, you've got a, you got a roster that's augmented by maybe cast-offs from other teams that mm-hmm. were mid-level to low-level free agents and undrafted free agents. Yeah, and if you're lucky with injuries, then it works like it worked in 2006, and they just need to hope that it works again mm-hmm. ten, in 2016. <laughs> right, right. So Yeah, it's scouting and it's drafting. And yeah. you've, I mean, you've mentioned it repeatedly, and I think everybody mm-hmm. who's watched this team, sure. covered this team, the drafting was abysmal for three years. It's very hard to have depth when you don't draft well. Right. I mean, you can live off undrafted free agents for only so long. No doubt. Roman Harper comes back. Obviously, uh, another move to try to bring a veteran guy in, like what they've done with Laurinaitis. We'll get to him in a moment. Uh, they look like they're going to play more of a of a three safety set, especially in, in passing downs. Brett, what have you seen so far out of Harper? Again, look, it's it's shirts and it's shirts and shorts. So I mean, for the right. most part, you know, I mean, it's you know, it's hard to tell. But what, just overall, his is presence what you've yeah. seen out of him going back to what he where was what he was before here to what he is now I'm optimistic about him for two reasons one he looks like he's in really good shape um, and he likes it here he know he you know he had pro bowl seasons when Dennis Allen was a secondary coach and now Dennis Allen is the defensive coordinator so you got to think that the coaches have a clear idea of what his strengths are it seems like they're trying to put they're hoping that they won't have to put him in positions, but they're gonna, injuries affects this. Yeah. You know, if he ends up being the starting strong safety because Vaccaro gets hurt or something, right. all of a sudden he can be exposed over the top like he was before <laughs> he got run out of town the last time, right? <laughs> so, uh, but if they're putting him in three safety sets like mm-hmm. they've been showing at, at practice and he's able to work to his strengths, I mean, we also have to remember that he's always been good against the run and I think even as a safety led the team in sacks one mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. If I remember right, no, you're right. And so, you know, uh, he, he's in good shape. He started the last two seasons for a very good defense in Carolina. Uh, could work. It could work great. Mm-hmm. It's just a ma- again, it's a matter of whether he's just there to bolster depth and play to his strengths, or whether he gets ends up because of other things ends up getting put in positions of weakness. You know, what's interesting about the Harper signing is Peyton all but said he's on the club. We didn't bring him in here to to cut him at the at the end of training camp. Uh, there, there may be a place for him in the organization after he retires down the line here. But I, I mentioned this on a previous show. I don't think I've heard that since Guido Merkins was here with Bump Phillips. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Where Guido's going to make the team. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 is, that is high praise on the part of, um, uh, of Peyton. But it also, it's something that we've never seen really here. I mean, you take for granted that Breeze is going to be around for sure. the most part. But, you know, just to come out and say, hey, Harper's going to be here and he's going to be contributing to this club. We're going to put him in a position to be successful. Yeah, I think a lot of that just shows how fragmented this team was uh, at times. And I think Sean Payton looked around the last couple of seasons, especially two years ago, 
and said, you know, what happened to, to my locker room here? I think a lot, a lot of ways he expected Breeze to always be able to kind of control it and that it would never really be an issue as long as Breeze was there. And for the first time, it really cracked two years ago when Junior Gallette was the yep. captain. And I mean, that was a, a, a catastrophe. And now you have an opportunity to get somebody on a really good contract. I mean, they're not paying Harper much at all. Know. They know he can be a spot player and do a certain thing very well. So it's low risk. Uh, and, and so it makes sense. And, and I'm sure when they told Roman Harper, you know, like they pitched him to come back to New Orleans, it was, hey, we're not going to cut you. We will play you. And so Sean Payton says, what the heck, you know, let's yeah. go for it. We've got, we got the spot. And if it doesn't work out later in the season, you can always make a move if you need to. But I think, he's, I mean, he'll definitely make a team. The linebacking position looks like it's been bolstered in the offseason. Two guys that were cast offs really from other teams. You know, I watched Craig Robinson going back and looking at the NFL Network replays and when I'm, I'm really trying to catch the Cleveland games. And uh, he performed fairly well when he had an opportunity to be in the nickel and dime situations. Obviously a good special teams player. Nate Stuper was a guy that was brought in uh, in Atlanta, played uh, just sparingly in, in terms of the every, every down linebacker was more of a guy that played special teams. But he got a chance toward the end of the season. Mm -hmm. and he looked pretty good, and you know, everybody's banking on Laurinaitis being able to at least get to be a part of the player that he was, or, or, or uh, a parcel of the player that he was in in, in Los Angeles slash St. Louis. Your thoughts on the linebacker core? Again, it's it's shells, but just your overall thoughts of how they're looking. Well, the key thing about Laurinaitis is that first of all, he started all 16 games, all seven years of his mm -hmm. career in St. Louis, so he's never not been a starter. For whatever reason, they decided to move on without him. Um, and, you know, he seems to be coming in with this attitude that I was fired in St. Louis and now I have to prove I should not have been fired. And he used the word mm -hmm. fired. Um, everyone respects his, uh, his kind of football IQ. And, um, and Dennis Allen today, when I spoke to him, compared bringing – Laurinaitis in from the Rams to bringing Vilma in from the Jets, mm -hmm. where Vilma, at the time he was traded away from the Jets for a fourth round draft mm -hmm. pick, he wasn't living up to what the Jets thought. Well, they changed their alignment. Yeah, they changed yeah, their alignment right. right. and everything. Yeah. And, uh, but he made that kind of comparison and said it was the thought process that we're getting a guy who can lend cohesion or create cohesion, I guess. To this unit, which, you know, as Peyton said oftentimes last year, they weren't getting lined up right and didn't have enough guys <laughs> on the field, the right number of guys. You know, and so Laurinaitis is a big part of that. And if he's physically in good shape and continues to show the durability that he mm -hmm. has shown throughout his career, he's 29 years old. It's really he's not over the hill yet, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So yeah. It could, it could be it could be a great thing for them, but yeah. there's no guarantees. You mentioned Vilma. It's similar to Curtis Lofton, though, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that was also a, a same, same situation. Yeah. Their middle linebacker spot has pretty much been bringing in guy. I mean, and Fajita was a cast off mm -hmm. as well. I mean, mm -hmm. they've never had a high profile right. linebacker. Right. They have a homegrown one for sure. Exactly. I mean, right. they bring in guys and make them right. work. I mean, so this isn't anything new to this franchise. I think this is a little bit more of a stretch than maybe those last two guys who were very much in their prime mm -hmm. still. So this will be a little bit more of an experiment. But he's got to be good. Yeah. If he's not good, they're in a lot of trouble. They're, they're right where they were last year in many ways. Yeah, I agree. But I will say this. Just based off what I saw last year, again, playing uh, in, in, in uh, the regular season with these guys, we'll put Laurinaitis on the side for a while. But when you talk about uh, Robinson and Stupar, they bring a little bit more speed to the table, mm -hmm. and then you add Stephon Anthony, who now is moving to an outside linebacker position. All of a sudden, you get a little bit more speed at that linebacker position. Yeah, Anthony is kind of also the insurance plan at middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. They're they're moving him over because you know he's young, he's going into his second season. But they liked what he did at middle linebacker. But they think that it makes more sense to have him play alongside mm -hmm. Laurinaitis in the middle and learn from Laurinaitis because Laurinaitis has the experience in terms of, you know, organizing everybody at the same time and being the "Quote unquote quarterback of the defense, but if Laurinaitis' physical performance isn't up to par, Anthony's going to go back over there, and he's routinely taking repetitions. There are times when the first team defense is out there, and Anthony's not there because he's second team middle linebacker, right? Because they want him also taking snaps at middle linebacker too, and being ready to jump in there. Um, undrafted free agents, anybody stick out to you uh, in camp over the uh, over the mini camp and the OTAs that you've had a chance to see? Well, just the guy from last year from UNH, uh, R.J. Harris. Right. He makes a lot of plays in the mm -hmm. receiving game. And, 
you know, but I don't know if he's going to end up being like that other receiver they had. I'm trying to remember his name now. He was he was a practice squad player for be the better part of three years, and he Adrian always... Adrian Arrington? <laughs> no, not him. Two? Uh, no, not him either. Uh, the, Tanner? The kid from... Te yeah, Andy Tanner. Andy the kid from Tanner, Texas Tanner, that used to yeah. catch bricks in high school or yeah. something like <laughs> right. that. You know, he always made plays in the preseason and in training camp, but never could quite crack the roster, and R.J. Harris could end up being one of those guys. But we talked about young receivers and not a lot of depth, so maybe... He will be a guy, even if he's on the practice squad, he could be a guy that ends up getting called up if there's injuries and stuff like that. He shows a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. It's always interesting to see it in a preseason game. Yeah. I mean, that's really where these guys, you know, Absolutely. they have essentially 30 plays in mm -hmm. preseason games to figure it out. Right, no, no doubt. Uh, Andres Pete has been moved to the right guard position right now. He looks like he's in that position. They're going to put him there, and uh, it would take an injury right now probably to move him out. Uh, it's interesting he's going to be on the right side. A lot of that, again, uh, uh, when you look at uh, his his. I guess future position will be at right tackle, so keeping on the right side makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, to me, uh, I, I, I think they'd be rolling the dice going into this season with Calamente, Lolito, and, and, and also Pete as your guards. First of all, your thoughts on, on Pete's move, and, and then do you think they'll go after a veteran guard here in between um, uh, the end of uh, minicamp and training camp? I think it's very possible. I mean, a lot of established veterans simply refuse to sign contracts until this dead period mm -hmm. because they don't want to do the OTAs. Yes. They feel like they know how to stay in shape. They know the game. Their, their family time, the work-life balance is important to them, and they just feel like they've earned the right to not really show up until training camp. So, I mean, uh, Kevin Williams last mm -hmm. year pretty right. much did, did a lot of that. So uh, I, would, I would say, um, you know, it's very possible. But I'm not really sure. You know, I couldn't give you any names as mm -hmm. to who they they may may right. go after. Leary and Dallas has been rumored to be on the trading block. Uh, do you see the Saints trying to make a trade for a guard? Do you see them standing pat with the basically the three they have and then some undrafted guys behind them that may have to fill out the roster? It would seem illogical for them to have made the investment they made last year in getting Unger, and that was a huge move mm -hmm. to trade Jimmy Graham and make that because you understood the importance of protecting Breeze and the interior to then go into this season with incredibly Im unproven or proven to not be very good mm -hmm. guards. And, and I just it's it counterintuitive Agreed. to think they are not going to make that move or don't at least have something in their back pocket to say that there's a way to upgrade this because they upgraded center and it was such a high priority. How can you not do it now for at least one of the guards? Right. Spots? And, and look, let's face it. You know, I've had this conversation. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about possibly going out and getting a Dwight, a Dwight mm -hmm. Freeney to, to be able to be that situational pass rusher. Although I think he's probably holding out to go to a team that has a legitimate shot, shot of getting the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. To me, I think you can manufacture a pass rush, but I think it's very difficult for you to be able to, especially when you're talking away about the way this team blocks inside out in terms of their design to protect Drew Brees. I think it's very difficult not to be able to take a look at the offensive line and say, man, you know what, that should be the priority here because if Brees goes down, the season is over. Mm -hmm. you, you, once you take it first and then Brett, why don't you grow and piggyback on it as well. Do you see them not going? I mean, I don't know how you go into the season without without at least trying to go look, look at the guard position before you look at the uh, pass rusher position in terms of bringing in somebody that, that may be a one-year flyer. This team, this entire franchise is built around Drew Brees. Uh, the, everything they do is built on the fact that as long as they have Drew Brees, they feel like they can be competitive. If Drew Brees does not have the ability to step up in the pocket, which we've seen over and over and over again over his 10 years in New Orleans, mm -hmm. when he has great guard play, he is really good. When he has subpar guard play, he gets swallowed in the backfield all the time and the offense stops moving. You saw it game to game last year. They're putting up 50 mm -hmm. points against New York and 40 points against Carolina, who nobody was putting up because the guards played well. And then the games that they struggled, they couldn't do anything. They, they know they have to invest in that position. They know Drew Brees is the entire franchise really. So of course they have to go, I mean, you would think that they have to go make a move. They have to know right. that. Brett, Brett, I mean, t to me, Freeney or a guy like that would be a luxury, even though it's a need, when you still, I think, still have some need, you know, either as a starter or, so, or some quality depth at the guard position. Well, one thing they could do, but it's a risk, is to, you know, to hope they stay healthy with who they have and then pick up a guard if someone gets hurt. Right. Um, they have tweaked a little bit of the blocking scheme, you know, this year. So, you know, um, Brett Ingles is gone and Dan mm -hmm. Ruscher is in. And last year, they... 
changed a little bit what the guards do, and it didn't seem to work out very well. Brett Engels kind of believed in the philosophy that it worked well with, um, you know, the Colts when they had Peyton Manning, which, you know, it seems to suit. The, the guards tend to stay in tighter and help the center more than they flare out to help the tackles. And it seems to suit tall quarterbacks who kind of know, based on the defensive read, where they're going with the ball before the snap, whereas Drew makes four reads and has to step up and throw. And, um, you know, just from talking to some of the linemen and some analysts, I get the impression Rooster's kind of going back to what they did before, uh, where the guards have the opportunity to, once they know the center's okay, to go out and help the tackles, which prevents someone from coming inside and collapsing the lower part of the pocket where Drew likes to step up and find his lanes. Yes. Um, so if that change in philosophy and blocking works out well um, and guys stay healthy, and, mm -hmm. you know, Lolito and Calamati have another year of experience, and then with, you know, and so does Pete. And with Pete, the idea is you want the best five guys, mm -hmm. best five linemen playing. And right now, I guess they feel that three of their best linemen happen to be three <laughs> offensive tackles. Yeah, so they got to put one of them right. at guard, and they just aren't ready to, you know, Streif with his experience is just outperforming as a tackle. He's outperforming yeah. Pete, so and Pete has to play he's guard. Significantly older. Yeah. yeah. Are not, right. You know. But still, graded out as one of the top right tackles in, in the football last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. You know, even even again on on what he has done. Yeah. Uh, you, you, and, and the contract is very very cap friendly as well. Right. With, and he was a little hurt last year right. too. Um, so he, uh, you know, you could see how he would struggle a little bit with uh, one of his arms to kind of. Um, punch and lock right with the speed uh, rushes is, especially yeah I mean, which is a big deal for his game because right. he's he's not a quick feet type mm -hmm. of guy up right. yes. and um, and he seems more healthy this year mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know obviously a lot of guys are at this point in the sure. season so if he can stay healthy and do that he could be better more like he was in 2011 before we shift gears and of course I'm sure the callers will, will bring us back to the Saints I, I want to ask something about coaching and the coaching staff uh, we had the love letter to New Orleans. We had Sean Payton talking uh, about, again, wanting to be here uh, in perpetuity. Uh, the, uh, 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 we were promised a more focused Sean Payton. Uh, you have Dennis Allen now, who, again, has been with this, been in the, with this coaching staff. He is a protege of, um, of Sean Payton. He is now the defensive coordinator. Uh, for the most part, the coaching staff pretty much still intact. We know we've got the same guys that have been here for uh, since since 2010. I'm sorry, since uh, since uh, 2006. Your thoughts on the coaching staff? Have you seen anything different? Is there a different feel? Uh, and, and as you've been through OTAs and minicamp, you know, uh, there's a different feel in the locker room. Um, but the coaching staff, there's a lot of stability to it, and. Uh, Roman Harper even made the comment that when he came back, he realized that he knew more coaches than players in the locker room because there's been so much turnover, especially on defense in the last two years. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there's – Sean is always trying to throw in new wrinkles in terms of building friendly competition among position groups and, you know, the go-kart thing that they did mm -hmm. last week and, um, you know, like non-football kind of fun competition mm -hmm. things that they do. The, it looked like the offensive coaches, um, and I saw a little bit written about this too. We we're all growing beards, almost mm -hmm. like hockey playoff beards. Mm -hmm. right. They were all they were all clean shaven today, so I'm not exactly. I never actually asked what was going on with that. But you get away with that in West <laughs> Virginia. I don't know if you're gonna get away with it here. No, nah. so. yeah. <laughs> so I know it must have been uncomfortable. But yeah. um, anyway, uh, you know I. I think that maybe the stability is good because a lot of those guys were around here when they won and, they, and they're trying to get back to what, what won, but a lot of it has to do with talent and health. Yes. And, and sometimes they haven't had good luck with that. And then, of course, the defense was just a little bit in disarray last year. Mm -hmm. so. Shift gears, I want to talk a little college baseball. I want to talk specifically about the coaches of Tulane and LSU. Uh, a lot of rumors out there swirling right now with David Pierce and Paul Maneri about possibly leaving their prospective teams. And let's talk first of all about David Pierce. You covered the, uh, the Green Wave for, for the New Orleans Advocate. Uh, he's in high demand. He had a great year. He's, he's rebuilt a program uh, that, that Rick Jones didn't leave the cupboard bare, but obviously he has capitalized on that. Uh, there's some big schools coming to call him right now, at least at, le at least it's rumored to that. Your thoughts on David Pierce, the job he did this year with this team, and uh, your thoughts about the Tulane, the ability to retain him. You know, all he really needs to put in his resume is five seasons, five regionals, and they've all been at large bids. Um, he's never won a conference tournament. So he's gotten teams in in leagues that don't get a ton of bids. Uh, in the Southland at Sam Houston State, he had three, and now two at Tulane. And he, 
really ended pretty prolonged streak at Tulane. Mm -hmm. of, of they didn't go to the tournament from 2008 right. all the way until last year. And last year they were really you know on the bubble uh, and got themselves in. This year they won a conference championship, and it has propelled him to where he is a legitimate name now. That's mm -hmm. five seasons in a row. It's difficult to do. You don't see it all that often, especially as guys change jobs. He's going to be a name that's on the market for as long as he's around. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be what it mm -hmm. is. I mean, that's how coaching works. Uh, that's a good thing for Tulane. Rick Jones almost left mm -hmm. several times. Rick Jones basically took the job at Georgia mm -hmm. in 2001, right. and it got pulled back because Tulane matched the offer. He almost took the job at Oklahoma, but they had a buyout in 2005. Mm -hmm. So this isn't rare. It's not unique. It's what happens when you have a good coach. It's a good problem for Tulane to have. I don't expect him to leave this offseason just based on talking to mm -hmm. him, people close to him, and where that buyout number kind of sits. But it's something to keep an eye on. And if Texas comes calling, then really – call the dogs off because right. that that is it's the best job in college baseball right. that, that was what I was going to ask you because you know it's been rumored Alabama's been rumored Texas sure I, I could see maybe you know not going to Alabama for a guy that's a Texas guy it's going to be difficult to turn down the Longhorns if it's offered isn't it it's not just the being a Texas guy I mean they have their own network yeah. they got a 6,000 seat baseball stadium they have the best facilities in the country they are in Austin I mean it's it's got it, everything you could ask for um, and the scholarship situation is a lot better right. than it is at Tulane. And explain that if you would, because I think that a lot of people, there's a disconnect there with fans that don't realize how different baseball is to the other sports and, and how much pressure it is on a guy like, um, like Pierce to be able to put together a quality club. Yeah, it's unbelievable when you think about it that David Pierce basically walks into someone's office and says, yeah, I want you to play first base for Tulane. And he says, I can offer you a half scholarship, so you owe us $30,000 for you to play first base. Mm -hmm. Come here instead of going to L LSU or mm -hmm. come here instead of going to Houston mm -hmm. where the price is half. Mm -hmm. So it really is difficult. And unless you get a situation like at Vanderbilt or Rice where they can stack scholarships where if you're a good academic student, you earn a half scholarship from the school, and then you earn a half scholarship from mm -hmm. baseball – you can stack them, and what Tulane does is you got a baseball scholarship, we're not touching you with regards to an academic scholarship, which makes things doubly difficult because that tuition is a top 10 in the country highest tuition. It's got to be some leverage on the part of Pierce down the line if another team comes a calling to say, hey, man, you know, I, I need some help here in terms of, of filling out my roster. That may be one of those bargaining chips. Yeah, Rick Jones thought he had that bargaining chip a couple of times. He's got to right. get it in writing it's yeah. from the admissions officer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, you, you obviously you cover Tulane, you, uh, LSU, UNO, all the sports here for the Associated Press. Your thoughts on Tulane, your thoughts on David Pierce, how he did this year, the program, and do you think he will stick around at Tulane for next season? Uh, well, I, I think it's I'm a little more impressed in some ways by what he did, that, you know, at Tulane the last two years than Sam Houston because, you know, at, at some of these state schools you can easily get junior college transfers and um, the money that the tuition is so much lower. And, uh, you know, in Texas, there's this huge baseball state like Louisiana. There's mm -hmm. probably a lot of homegrown talent that you can plug in there. Um, and so at, at Tulane, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder when, you, when exactly what Scott said, where kids have to pay a lot of money. To, it, it, what he has to sell, though, is that Tulane does have a, a nice program and nice facilities mm -hmm. and a great baseball stadium. So it's kind of a balance. But his recruiting pool is limited because he's got to find people who can pay. So uh, he's shown that he can do it both ways. He can do it at a state school. He can do it at a private school. You put him at a state school with huge money like Texas, mm -hmm. you have to imagine he'd be very successful. Yes. But Troy Dannon, I think, is an enlightened athletic director for the type of school that Tulane is and that he believes he, he wants in a way. Like he'll come out and say, I want Pierce to get the job that he wants. I'm going to support him in that way because, you know, he, he's basically saying, to the next up and coming coach, you know, Tulane is a place where your all your dreams can come true, right. even if it's not here, if it's somewhere else. But we, you know, you might be here, you know, if 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 all the kind of variables come together at the right time. So what Dannon does is he makes Tulane the type of environment where people aren't going to leave unless it's the right fit. They're not just going to leave for some other job that's paying more. You know, they're going to leave. For their, they're only going to leave for maybe their right. dream job or something yes. close to that, which Texas would be. Yeah. Sure. But or maybe not Alabama. Right. 
you know, depending on what, what the situation is up there, and I don't know that much about that. Yeah. Today, rumors flying that uh, Paul Maneri had a flirtation with the University of Texas. Uh, uh, but that led, according to the advocate today, that uh, Paul Maneri got a bump in salary. Uh, looks like he's going to be staying with the Tigers. Y your thoughts on that situation? Just, you know, walk up to your AD, show a 512 area code on your cell phone, <laughs> yeah. and watch an extension come in <laughs> right. and watch a raise come in. It's unbelievable. He's like the fifth coach mm -hmm. in the country to get a significant bump right. just because he talked to Texas. I mean, they're not even saying these are formal offers. They're not even getting mm -hmm. into numbers. I mean, it's incredible. Louisville, TCU, Virginia, Florida, everybody is getting paid because Texas is looking for a coach and Texas has so much to offer that they know that if, this, if, if they come after him, they got to mm -hmm. pony up money because they don't have it on any other basis. So good for LSU. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, it, it's probably the best job in the country, LSU, mm -hmm. when you consider the support and you consider, you, but it's also a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah, tremendous. Palmineri gets hit harder than just about any mm -hmm. baseball coach in the country. And now, as of this morning, he was not the highest mm -hmm. paid coach in the country. Mm -hmm. He might be now. Yes. Um, and he probably deserves it considering what that job comes yeah. with. Uh, probably his best coaching job, maybe, maybe since he's been in LSU this year? Well, um, in terms of getting him to the, to the Super Regional, you could say that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I mean, a team that was not thought to go that far, and let's face it, 21 comeback, uh, cover behind wins, the streak. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, I mean, of course, they ran into a coast, uh, into a coast Carolina team that, at least on that weekend, was, was, a, was a much better program. But, uh, you know, I, I think he did a fantastic job this year uh, under a lot of scrutiny as usual. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny. The problem for Joe Oliva with coaches like Miles and Maneri is that because they're paid a lot to begin with, they can afford really good agents. And really good agents know that any time you sense that um, the fan base may be putting pressure on the AD, uh, you know, with dissatisfaction about the coach, because a lot of the fan base may not understand what a, what, what a good job Maneri did. They just know that they lost to Coastal mm -hmm. Carolina and they're not in <laughs> Omaha, right. right? So agents know how to work leverage by at least giving the appearance that you know, before you start criticizing this guy too much or thinking, you know, think about getting rid of him, there's yeah. some other big schools that would love to have him. Yes. You know, and so they play that game, and we've seen it with Miles, mm -hmm. with, with Michigan and Arkansas, with his agent doing the same thing. And uh, and oftentimes, you know, I think uh, Oliva feels like the best thing he can do at that point is just to give him a little bump and stop all that chatter because it becomes kind of a distraction that he doesn't want to deal with. Absolutely, especially when you're talking about the Major League Draft, and players trying to make a decision on whether they're going to go to the Major Leagues or not, players on your own team, players that, that, that you've recruited that, that now have been high round draft choices, they may be thinking, you know what, uh, I can go to LSU, I can, uh, I mean, I make the money there, but I can improve my draft stock, and I can get that great LSU baseball experience as well. Guys, hang tight. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We'll talk some Pelicans, and then we'll open up the phone lines. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports each and every Thursday night at 6 p.m., also on Friday at 10 p.m. right here on WLAE TV. Friday also, 9 p.m. across the state on Pelican Sports uh, Network at 9 p.m. Scott Kushner of The Advocate, Brett Martell, The Associated Press, are my guest tonight. I'm Eric Asher. I'm your host. We'll be right back. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... Located on Lake Pontchartrain. Frisbee's Lakefront Restaurant and Bar offers traditional West End favorites, a scenic view, oysters, and numerous tasty options. More information is available at 504-304-4125 or brisbeesrestaurant.com. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. My life is full of statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself, but I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. 
Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. Our guest tonight, Scott Kushner of the New Orleans Advocate and Brett Martell of the Associated Press. We'll go on the phone lines in just a few minutes. Let's shift to the New Orleans Pelicans. We're a week away from the uh, from the NBA draft. Uh, I'm, I'm, we talked about it a lot extensively on this program last week. I almost talked about it on one of the few shows on radio that almost talks Pelicans every single day. Looks like Dell Demps is going to be retained. Uh, at this point, still no conversation between Demps or any of the hierarchy uh, with the uh, with the Benson organization when it comes to the Pelicans. Uh, your thoughts on, on Demps being retained and um, on a little bit of a hot seat, I'd have to say, going in, 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 into the into the draft and free agency. I think it's pretty clear that this is uh, if they do not put together uh, at least a playoff season. There's no way he can come back. And he's coming back in large part because they made a choice last year. Uh, Monty Williams and Dell Demps essentially had squared off um, per, you know, you talk to people around that building and around the organization. And, and Dell basically won. Uh, I think there was some, you know, there were some frustrations with the roster from Monty's side. And uh, Dell had built that roster. And they gave Dell a, a significant extension and a, a decent raise and said, this is your franchise. And they struggled last year, and there was some serious problems. But at the same time, you can pin a lot of it on 300-plus games lost to injury. Mm -hmm. We don't know how far away they would have been. I don't think they would have been where they thought they were going to be. Like six or seven, right? To start of the year, yeah. everybody was saying, you know, yeah. can they vie for home court? They wouldn't have been close, no. even if they were healthy no last way. year. Um, so I think it would have been a disappointment regardless. But having that many injuries, there's a natural built-in excuse to kind of say, let's give this another try. We still have a, a tremendous talent in Anthony Davis. They're not a rudderless ship by any stretch because they have Holiday and Davis, who you can certainly build around. And then uh, they can kind of move from there. And I think bringing Danny Ferry in makes a lot of sense because yeah. he needs – help in that executive role. I think that that was abundantly clear last season. Uh, I want to I want to piggyback on something you said before I go to you, Brett. Okay, I, I get the injuries. No team can overcome the type of injuries this team had last year. Uh, as I've said on this program, the radio show, you've got some guys that you knew were predisposed to injuries. You've been yeah. dealing with injured guys. These guys have been injured for a few seasons now. At some point, you know, you cut bait on guys like that. Yeah. You know, you realize that they're not reliable. On the flip side, you had an opportunity to move two guys in, in Eric Gordon and Ryan Anderson. And in the NBA, you just don't let guys go that you're not going to re-sign. I mean, that is a mortal sin in the NBA. So, yeah, I get the injury situation, but uh, I, I don't think he can be forgiven for not getting something for two players they're not going to bring back. Uh, I think that has been some of his shortcomings. And, not, and again, almost saying, to, saying that, I've got to stand pat to prove that I'm right and Monty was the problem when not really upgrading this roster and then going out and, 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 and putting another Albatross contract around the necks of, of, of this organization with the Amerishik deal, which, you know, from what I understand from talking national correspondence, they've been try they tried to move him the entire season and there were no takers at all. So a lot of that's got to be put on Demps at this point, you know, where he has failed as a general manager in upgrading this roster and also giving Alvin Gentry a roster that works with his system. Right now, I don't think that roster works with the system. No. Your thoughts. And, that and was, you're there every game. Yeah, and that was the thought was we can unleash these guys. We take them out of my system. Mm -hmm. They're going to run and gun up the floor. Anthony Davis, we're going to get the Ferrari out of the garage mm -hmm. and have him moving. And they tried it and it didn't work. I mean, they just they had guys who didn't want to run and guys who really couldn't run Could and weren't, run. That's and weren't, right. and weren't run. particularly good at it. Now, them missing Quincy Pondexter for the whole season Agreed. really killed them on the wing the entire year. But a lot of the things you say are clearly have merit. There are significant issues. When you looked at that trade deadline and they couldn't get anything done, I think that was as much of Dell saying, I'm not taking five cents on the dollar. Right. Well, you want to give me 10 cents, fine. I'm not taking five cents on the dollar, and I'm not taking anything that's going to long-term hurt us. We're not going to take a longer contract that doesn't work. And I get he'd, that. He'd rather free the books. That's talking to everybody mm -hmm. around there. It says he'd rather free the books for this summer than he would you know, get a player that might work or might work in the system. I think there was some frustration mm -hmm. in the front office, in the coaching staff around that. But... It does happen, and that's kind of where the, the executive decisions get made. Brett, you're there every every game as well. Give us your take on Demps, the, his his job performance, especially in, in recent times, and I, and again going you know pre uh, with Monty and then post Monty. I do think it's really, especially in basketball, hard to judge his job performance because if if you look at all the good teams in the NBA, they basically have two to three star players, then they have two to three 
second tier players, and then basically a bunch of role players. And, and that's it. And there's 12 guys that rest per game and five guys on the floor at a time. So if you have one or two star players go down, you're finished. And I mean, they had Anthony for most of the year, but pretty much everybody else of significance was hurt for an extended period of time. And uh, so they, you know, they amazingly probably won 30 games. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, right. I, I think the Gentry actually did a pretty good job with some of the, when you consider some of the guys they, they brought in and, mm -hmm. and stuff. But, uh, you know, Ashik's contract, it's tough. It, it looked really bad last year because of how he played. Um, I think he had an illness in the off season that affected his conditioning. And then he showed up for training camp and got hurt and tore his calf mm -hmm. and didn't get a training camp. So you have a, a center who really needs to be in great shape to play in that system, not, not to mention it's a new system. He doesn't have a training camp, mm -hmm. so he's lost and trying to catch up the whole time, and that can affect his confidence. And So that, you know, we don't know what we're going to get out of him. But with the new salary cap, his contract might not look as bad a couple right. of years from now. It, it? it won't, but does he have the skill set to be able to play the system and Alvin Gentry has there? He does in that, that all they really want him to do is defense, play defense and rebound. They don't want him – they against certain guys. Too. Yeah, against certain guys. They really looked at mm -hmm. him as kind of a luxury, that they could that they could have a stout defender and rebounder against certain type of guys, and they wouldn't really rely on him, and, and he wouldn't be exposed and criticized because all these other guys would be healthy. Mm -hmm. All these other guys who have shown they can average 20-plus points a game yeah. would be doing that, mm -hmm. and he would just be playing his role when they needed him, and, and that would be it. But, you know all the other guys were hurt and so yeah. and know, it was damning evidence yeah. at the end of the season when Kendrick Perkins yeah. when he was healthy I mean right. he was starting yeah. games right. and yeah. Kendrick Perkins who is not in good shape no, either good shape. he was brought he in was to be an influence on the bench and he yeah. was playing right. every fourth quarter and every crunch time situation over Oshik and Gentry kept saying ah eh, you know it's not anything mm -hmm. we're just not and it's like you can yeah. say what you want. It, it is every single game you're playing Kendrick Perkins right. who has almost nothing left in the tank in an NBA uh, skill set over Ashik, something's yeah. going on there, and they they didn't really address it ever. Right. So, um, and like you said, Quincy being out, um, you know, it's not that Quincy's a star player or anything, no. but he's a glue guy. But he's a glue guy, and and that can that again can hurt. Um, you know, he he makes timely shots from the perimeter, perimeter and he plays good perimeter defense right. on the wing, and so that that hurts too. No doubt. Eight six six three two zero zero is the phone number. We'll go to the phone lines in just a moment. All right, Danny Ferry's brought in as a, as a special advisor. We're not sure what that means. Uh, at least gives Demp someone to bounce things off of. Uh, I think it's critical to, to at least maybe get the fan base on board here. You know, Ferry's had, had um, success everywhere he's been. Of course, he's coming off the email scandal in Atlanta, which, uh, again, kind of tainted his reputation. But uh, how much influence do you think he'll have? I think he'll have a good bit of influence. Him and Dell are very close. This was Dell's decision to bring in Danny Ferry. I think uh, on its face when everybody looked at it, they said, mm -hmm. uh, they're going above his head. They're going to hire somebody above Dell. Above Del. That's not the case. He's, he really is a true advisor. But he's someone who has sat in the room, has built championship-type contenders in Atlanta and in Cleveland, mm -hmm. two number one seeds. He's built good teams, and he's been through these wars, and he knows. And, and, and nobody else, they don't have an assistant GM. They have an assistant GM for mm -hmm. three years. Mm -hmm. So Dell's really operated on a significantly higher plane than everybody else in that organization. Now he has someone who's at least been through the experience of trying to build a long-term winner, whereas nobody else really in that organization has had to make those calls. So it does make a lot of sense to bring him in. He's available. Mm -hmm. He's a little tainted from a public perception. Yeah, sure. public perception. But otherwise, I think it, it's it's really one of the smarter moves they've made. Well, for a drowning franchise, you know, he is, he is kind of a, uh, an opportunity to be able to get a lifeboat more yeah. than anything else. You know, throw, the, throw the, uh, the ring to him in the middle of the water because at this point, fan base are saying, fans are saying, you know, forget about what happened in Atlanta. We need somebody to come in and help. Your, th your thoughts on Ferry, what type of influence he can have on this franchise? Well, the parallel I see is that his time in Cleveland was when LeBron was a young player, mm -hmm. and they were making the first run around mm -hmm. him. So now you look at Anthony Davis as a young player, and they're trying to build around him as, as he's developing mm -hmm. into a hopefully a superstar. So um, there's that. And then, of course, he did. I, I think he exceeded expectations in Atlanta. And really, the reason he's not in Atlanta, I'm not sure how much that has to do with basketball. Nothing. No, it's nothing. <laughs> Zero. It was, it, was, it was the internet yeah. scandal. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, that's not good, but whatever. You know, he definitely has knowledge about basketball, and he's friends with Dell Demps. And, and, um, and so, if he can give Demps good information about personnel to put around a young, rising star, 
to make them more competitive, and that's that can only be good. Sixth overall pick, where do you think they go? I think you have to get a shooter on this team. Without Eric Gordon, without Ryan Anderson, we're under the assumption they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. Buddy Heald, to me, is the perfect mm -hmm. fit. If Chris Dunn drops, uh, based on everyone you talk to over there, I think that's where they go. I, Del Demps, from all indications, is kind of in love with him, and he wants if to be in New Orleans. both guys are on the board, what do you think happens? I think they go with Dunn. With Dunn? If Dunn's available, I'm almost 90% confident. Is, is that because Drew Holiday's in the last year is deal, or is that to get another guard, another combo guard that can come in here? Another combo guard to come in that can lead them mm -hmm. into the future because Holiday and Dunn can work together, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. sort of what they see. Where Tyreek stands in all this is different, right. but – Dell has never shown any problems with having three, you know, frontline guards in the roster. Yeah. So I, they just love Dunn's game from everything that you hear. Your thoughts? Yeah. Um, and I, I agree with Scott, and I would say that uh, with Dell, you know, people keep wondering about a trade because he's traded draft picks since AD. Um, but what I think Dell really does is he looks on a case by case basis. If he doesn't think the draft class is strong enough, and he can get a, better, a veteran that will help them mm -hmm. improve faster. That's what he does. Um, but this, the top eight players of this draft appear to be pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a strong likelihood that Dell will say, well, no, this is, a, this is an instance where the sixth pick is worth more picking a rookie than it is to trade it for, mm -hmm. um, you know, a mid-level veteran. And so um, I could see him going with the players you know, the, the, you, exactly the same ones yeah. that you said. And if, if they get either of those guys, then Eric certainly won't come back. But they do have the money to bring back mm -hmm. Eric or, or Ryan, mm -hmm. um, and they certainly haven't burnt any bridges with those mm -hmm. guys. It just kind of depends. They have to see what they get in the draft first mm -hmm. and then which guy they need more, um, and they can bring them back. Scott, before we go to the phone lines, how active will they be in free agency? How can they sell this club to, to a free agent when everything is even out there with the money? How do they sell coming to New Orleans? And, I, and let, let, let's take the Anthony Davis factor out of this. I was going to say, two words. Yeah, that, 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 okay. yeah. I mean, I mean I, that, that, that's, uh, you know, that's pretty much predetermined on that. But, sure. I mean, you know. The, there's, I mean, the facility is nice. Okay. Anthony Davis is here, so right. we'll take that True. out of the equation. Right. Alvin Gentry is a much better salesperson than I think uh, people recognize. You've been around him a lot. Mm -hmm. You've probably talked mm -hmm. to him. I mean, he's a very affable, easygoing. He's one, probably the most popular person I've ever been around as far as one of those, you know, being in an NBA hallway, everyone from every other team comes up to say hello. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, so if he's in the room talking to somebody, I can see him, you know, if money's even, convincing someone to come play with Anthony Davis and, and get this going. I mean, Chris Dunn has come out and said he wants to play in New mm -hmm. Orleans and has said he doesn't want to go to Boston, has said he doesn't want to go to Phoenix. So it's not as if this is like, this is the, the tundra. We're not right. we're in the middle of nowhere. You're sure. not in Siberia out here. I mean, this is, uh, th there's still a viable NBA situation. They were in the playoffs last year. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's under, it is not Sacramento. Right. Let's put it that way. Your thoughts? Right. I think that Gentry is, I mean, he all he has to do is say, well, just ask Steph Curry. I mean, if he liked playing for me as a top assistant, mm -hmm. you know, and so he has credibility in terms of luring guys as a coach um, and, you know, a coach that players want to play for. And then, you know, a pe players want to play with rising superstars. So you've got AD and uh, New Orleans is an increasingly attractive city and the, the facilities are really good. So, um, you know, I think that they they have potential. They're just kind of the current regime is running out of time to take advantage of yeah, it. No, there's no doubt about that. Let's head to the phone lines. Thanks for your patience tonight. 866-3200 to Homa and Greg. Greg, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Uh, hey, guys. I got a, a question I need an opinion on. How does the analyst and, and everybody else predict the Saints' record early in the season when we don't even know who's going to make the 53-man roster, and I'll hang up and listen. Thank you, Greg. You know, I, I, I laugh about that as well. You know, I think all of us try to say maybe 500, something like that, but at the end, at the end of the day, the turnover in NFL rosters, possibly the guys getting injured, I think it's hard to know, and really until you get into the dog days of training camp and into the preseason until you really gauge an NFL team, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not in the business of predicting them. But yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I just go to Jackson Square and I talk to some people <laughs> over there and, and I pretty much get everything I need from them. Well, leave that, leave that number with me before we, before we get out of here today. I, I need to check that out as well. Let's go to Herm in New Orleans. Herm, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Herm. Question, LSU football question. Uh, Go ahead. I think LSU's offensive coordinator for you, Leonard Fournette, 
something more play action or some big pitch out type plays. I saw the Alabama game, couldn't believe my eyes. It was running right into the, like a stone wall. Uh, I'll sit back and see what's the answer. Thanks. Brett, you cover LSU football. Do you think they'll diversify the uh, the offense a little bit more uh, in, th in this upcoming season? Well, I mean, we're, I, here, we're hearing that, that Leonard Fournette's going to catch the ball at the backfield a little bit more. Yeah, That's what we're hearing right now. Right, yeah. I think there's the hope that they can do that with uh, Brandon Harris being more, um, you know, having another year of maturity and, and so forth. And, I mean, it seems like common sense. And at the same time, uh, I feel like Les is a little stubborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know. It's, can he afford to be stubborn this year, though? I don't know. I don't know. The, the problem is that, you know, it's like you start riding the train because his stubbornness often works early on in the season mm -hmm. and then until you run into an elite yeah, to, team to Alabama. that knows how to game and Nick Saban <laughs> right. knows how to game plan exactly yeah. what your strengths are and take that away and then all of a sudden the weaknesses or or maybe it's not even – it's your not that it's not a weakness. Right. Yeah, it's just that it's something you haven't worked on all mm -hmm. year long, which could have been a strength, but you haven't worked on it all year because you haven't had to. All of a sudden you're relying on that. If you can't do that, you lose. So hopefully – in these mismatches that they're going to have in the front end of the season, mm -hmm. uh, not Wisconsin, but some of the games yes. after that, they're going to be working on every kind of play in the arsenal so that when they go up against a team like Alabama, mm -hmm. they will be comfortable with a you know, diverse game plan. Right. Can, can, can Miles, or the offensive coordinator, uh, afford yeah. to do a repeat of last year? I mean, uh, uh, Literally, they were look. If, if it wasn't for the state's money troubles and, and and the cuts to LSU, Les Miles would be coaching. I'm not saying he would be sitting on the sidelines doing ESPN, but he'd be coaching elsewhere. More than likely, yeah. That's that's that seems to be uh, right. prevailing wisdom. You've got a strength though. Uh, he really the strength of this team is Leonard Fournette mm -hmm. and it's Darius Geis. I mean, those guys are really they're the most talented players on the team. They have a strong offensive mm -hmm. line and they do something that a lot of teams aren't ready for, which mm -hmm. is to just pound you up the mm -hmm. middle. And now they're you're going to face teams where it struggles. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of teams are throwing the ball in Alabama right. either, though. It's True. not as if they were weak in the secondary right. and would have been able to just fling it. I mean, you lose to Alabama because Alabama's really right. good. But you would have rather seen Harris get on the outside a little bit, maybe utilize his athleticism to mix it up a little bit. I think that's where fans really got upset last year. Yeah, when you don't see him trying right. anything different, that's what drives people crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything comes back. I feel like every LSU mind comes mm -hmm. back to 2011 mm -hmm. and that national championship oh, yeah. game. And that is like the crystallization mm -hmm. of the, every frustration mm -hmm. about Les Miles is that they just kept trying the same thing over well, and over Well, and I think again. that's what frustrates Tiger fans because it doesn't seem like he's learned from those mistakes. I mean, honestly, Brett, I mean, when you will repeat the same thing over and over again, we know how that ends. I think you're supposedly crazy or something, yeah, right? Yeah, something <laughs> like that. That's the definition say? of yeah. insanity. Yeah, right? it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes – Les talks like he's insane, but I don't think he is. I mean, he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he he does what I think a lot of people do, which is they they get comfortable with what they're good at and they default to it. And and then when it doesn't work, some people are good at, adju at adjusting on the fly and others struggle with it a little more. Um, you know, uh, he does have a lot of really talented players mm -hmm. on that team, especially on offense, tons of returning starters. Yes. But, you know, even when they did beat Alabama in 2011 in the regular season, the offense was lost. And it was just yeah. an, like a miracle play by Eric yeah. Reed, basically, yeah. and then an interception by Morris mm -hmm. Claiborne. They should have been two years <laughs> later. I mean, you know, it's like yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, I, I can't promise anything in terms of his not being stubborn when it comes to that point in the season. But if he gets a little more flexible, if Cam Cameron, you know, he and Cam mm -hmm. both see the writing on the wall. Sure. Could be interesting. Yep, could be. Let's head to the final phone call. Brian is in Metairie. Hey, Brian, welcome to Inside New Orleans. Hi, gentlemen. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I got two things. First thing I want to ask, and I don't claim to know contracts and injuries and all, why do we continue after going into the third season to keep Bird in our secondary, for one? Secondly, they're talking about depth on the line. This is where I think we fumbled the ball during the draft. We wasted, in my personal opinion, a draft pick on a reach of a guy in Canada. They had a lot of offensive linemen on the board at that time. I think they're looking for something that's not there tomorrow, not today. I'll wait and listen to your call. Thank you, Brian. A lot of fans are, are upset with Jarris Bird. This is kind of the last hurrah for Jarris Bird as a Saint, in my opinion. It is, and, you know, he's uh, often not been healthy, mm -hmm. and I haven't really seen, you know, that's another thing when you talk about minicamp. I mean, uh, he really hasn't been practicing, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
it's the same old story for the third year in a row, and you right. wonder where he's going to end up. But and and it, the cap, the cap is part of this as yeah, well. I mean, it, I mean it is, they, they there kind are cap of, ramifications they, to cutting him. There's yeah. only so many guys they can get rid of, and right. if you're getting rid of Brandon Browner and so forth, and you know, then you right. got it. I mean, they, they're so they're keeping him, but this is it for him. I mean, if he doesn't have a good year this year, um, he. he he won't be playing. Well, here they drafted his heir apparent. Yeah, I mean they did. Mm -hmm. So he won't be playing here. Probably even. I mean, if he doesn't have a great year this yeah. year, he probably won't be playing <laughs> here. Right. And if he doesn't have a good year, he might not be playing anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to even tell sometimes. He's such a calculated pro when you talk to him in the locker room. He grew up the son of an NFL player. Mm -hmm. He knows the game really well. He's a super athlete, but he just seems so unemotional. It's hard to tell how. Com if, if his heart's still in it, mm -hmm. it's just hard. I, it might be, but it's just, it's right. not overtly, like, apparent, obvious, whatever. He, he's not the about. same player he was in Buffalo. Yeah. Maybe that's due to injury, whatever mm -hmm. it is. He's just not the same player. And I watched him at Buffalo. Your thoughts? Yeah, he's been, uh, like, that is, he's the <laughs> the incarnation right. of everything that they've done wrong yeah. from a free agency oh, perspective is just way <laughs> overpaying for a guy and thinking they were a piece away and they were nowhere close to a piece away. And the piece they got was nowhere near the piece right. that they thought they had. Right. So. And as far as the draft goes, I agree with Brian. There, there are some reaches in this draft where you thought they might go defense in the second round. Mm -hmm. They go with a wide receiver. You look at the David on uh, uh, Yamato pick, uh, still needing help at pass rusher and offensive line. Only time will tell if ultimately uh, those guys pan out and ultimately become uh, mainstays for this uh, for this uh, team. They, they need some of these young players to emerge. They need last year's draft choices to, to emerge, and they need years, this year's draft choices to at least make an impact. There's no doubt about it. Guys, thanks so much for being with us tonight here on Inside New Orleans Sports. Scott Kusher, the New Orleans Advocate, and also Brett Martell, the Associated Press. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLE at 10 p.m. Also on Pelican Sports Television, 9 p.m. every Friday night. That is statewide. Also, you can catch me on the radio, 990 a.m. WGSO, weekdays, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. You can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com, and every single episode of the award-winning Inside New Orleans Sports can be seen at ericasher.com as well. And don't forget about that TuneIn radio app. It's a, it's a free download for your smartphone or tablet, and you can take WGSO and Inside New Orleans with you anywhere. Again, special thanks to our guests. Brett Martell, and also uh, Scott Kushner. Also to the WLE production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Kenny Juno, Juno Naila Jones, Philip Williamson, and my director, William Hill. New Orleans, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. Thanks to our guest. Have a great evening. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is the first place award winner of the 2015 New Orleans Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show.